Let's start with thawing because when you're cooking with frozen fish, first thing you need to do is thaw the fish. So I'm going to grab a filet of Pacific halibut out of the freezer here. If frozen fish is new to you, thawing is probably a new part of your routine. And it's some of the freshest fish you can buy because it's frozen at the peak of freshness. First thing I'm going to show you is how to defrost seafood overnight. This is sort of the classic way to do it. Vacuum sealed seafood raw, you want to take it out of the vacuum seal first. This is a food safety element. You don't ever want to thaw or defrost raw seafood while it's in a low oxygen environment. So we're going to take it out of the package first, plop it onto a plate. So um, you might notice there's a thick layer of ice on the fillets. This is not freezer burn. This is actually supposed to be there. This thick layer is an ice glaze. The ice glaze is applied to the fish after it's been frozen as sort of like an extra layer of armor. So taking it out of the package means that this ice glaze can defrost without being trapped against the fillet. And that means you're going to have a less soggy fillet Put it directly on a plate, something with a rim. You can put it on a baking sheet in a bowl, anything where you're just having a surface that you're not going to have any spillage. And that's just going to go straight into the fridge on a low shelf and leave it overnight. 10 to 12 hours is usually pretty good. Very hands off. You know, all we did was take it out of the package and put it on a plate. And then it's ready to cook for breakfast, lunch, dinner the next morning. You can leave it in the fridge on a plate like this for up to two or three days and still have the fish be good to eat. If you are planning to leave it in the fridge for longer than a day, I would recommend covering it at that point because the fridge can dry out the surface of the fish. The next way that I'm going to demonstrate is actually what I call the quick thaw. And this is when you're defrosting fish on the countertop, but you want to do it safely. We're going to start with a resealable bag. It might seem redundant to take fish out of a package and put it back into a resealable package, but that's what we're going to do. We're just having a bag that can be sealed tightly nothing vacuum sealed. And then this is gonna go into a bowl of cold tap water. So not hot water, not warm water. We just want cold or cool tap water straight out of your kitchen sink. You might need to weigh it down with something like a plate could be good because it will probably float. Leaving it like this on the countertop, we can expect this to be defrosted in about 30 minutes to an hour, depending on the thickness of the filet, I change out the water every 30 minutes in case it's getting too warm, you know, on a really hot day. You want this water to stay pretty cool. Over the course of an hour, the fish will defrost gradually. Um, we're not going from super cold to super hot, so we're helping to maintain the quality of the fish. And then after that 30 minutes or an hour are up, make sure you pat the fish dry because some of the ice glaze will be in this resealable bag with it. And then you're ready to cook. So this is probably my go-to way for defrosting seafood because I don't always remember to do this overnight. I don't always plan to cook fish. Sometimes I want to cook fish in a pinch and uh, I'm hungry now. So how do I get fish now? This is the way. The one thing I do want to mention is if you defrost it like this, you need to cook it as soon as it's defrosted. Not necessarily that minute, but because you're defrosting it on the countertop for food safety purposes, you can't put it in the fridge for, for dinner. You can't leave it for another day. You need to cook it and then put it in the fridge. If you don't feel like defrosting your seafood at all, there's always the option to cook seafood from frozen. The way to do that, I would recommend trying it with salmon. So you can cook salmon from frozen 15 minutes from freezer to stove top to table, and you'll get nice crispy skin. You lose some control over the doneness of the fish by doing that. And I would say it's not quite as juicy as if you're able to take an hour to defrost. However, if you have a good sauce and you're hungry, I definitely don't discourage it. I've cooked salmon from frozen when I'm hungry in a pinch and it it's it really satisfies. Um, all right, let's start talking about some essentials. This is part two, essentials for cooking wild caught seafood at home. There are just a few essential tools that can make it easier. And oftentimes it's just a matter of timing and temperature. So making these small adjustments is going to make it very easy for you to really, really master cooking fish at home. You don't need to be afraid about messing it up. So the number one thing that I'll recommend, the how-to cooking guides that we have on our site. The cover 
probably the three or four major cooking methods that you're going to use at home. So having these guides is going to be really helpful to give you an idea of what the cook time is, what the proper technique is to make sure that you're really getting the most out of your fish. In terms of maybe real, real things, the first thing that I want to mention is the humble kitchen towel. So whether it's kitchen towels, paper towels, you really want to have a big stack of these available to you because the number one thing that I think can elevate your fish cooking skills at home are just remembering to pat the fish dry. Don't overlook this step, especially when you're searing, grilling, broiling, the reason is any moisture that's left on the surface of the fish is going to steam the surface of the fish. And this really will limit how much texture you can get out of it. Whether you're trying to get grill marks, trying to get a nice crisp golden sear, it'll make it easier for the fish to stick to the pan if there's moisture on it as well. So don't skip this step. It is really, really a revelation if you've never patted fish dry before cooking it. So the next thing I want to mention is my fish spatula. It's a very thin, flexible spatula. This one's so clunky, can't move at all. It barely holds half a fillet of fish, you know? So when you're using this to transfer fish from a baking sheet to a plate. If you're trying to flip fish in a pan, this is going to make it so much easier and so much more foolproof. You'll just be flipping fish all day. The next tool, um, instant read thermometers. These are really, really helpful for getting to know the doneness of fish. It'll really help you dial in what the optimal temperature is for the thickest part of the filet, aka the internal temperature of the fish. Having something that's an instant read is really, really important, really good. Next things I want to mention are not tools, but I have a couple ingredients that I wanted to feature. I often mention panko breadcrumbs, great for mixing into something like fish cakes as a binding ingredient. You can use this as like a topping on fish or like a bake, drizzle some olive oil on it. That'll get nice and crispy and crunchy. You could also use this to coat the fish kind of like a breaded fish, but it'll be extra, extra crunchy. I find that it makes even just a simple filet feel like more of a complete meal. Having something like that will really help you mix things up. So you're not just having the same filet on a plate with a side of vegetables. You have a little more um, of that like textural firework happening. The next ingredient I want to highlight actually is my cooking oil that I'm using. I just switched over to a new cooking oil. This is a high heat cooking oil that can really withstand high temperature cooking. So pan searing, grilling, no problem. We're not going to have a smoky oil that's adding like a burnt crust to the fish. So having a really good cooking oil for high temperature cooking is an absolute must. One more ingredient that I'd love to mention today is, and I mention this almost every time, is miso paste. So miso paste, I really recommend if you like cooking seafood and you'd like to get a little experimental in the kitchen because it's a great base for umami. It's just a really nice salty rich flavor that develops that's wonderful in dressings, marinades, compound butters. And what I mean by compound butter is really even just as basic as mixing miso with something like softened butter. I like to do a 50-50 mix, just mash it up together. And this we can put on the salmon later once it's seared. I think that this is a really nice ingredient to complement the flavor of seafood. Even if you don't like breadcrumbs, you don't like miso, you don't plan on pan searing, think about what you want to build into your pantry so that you have a really good starting point for cooking seafood so that you're set up for cooking seafood. That way you don't have to think too much about how to make something taste delicious. You already have a few of the building blocks there to bring a meal together. And I, yeah, I'll just give another shout out, I guess, to the member experience team. If you are looking for tips on how to cook something, please reach out to them. They are a wonderful resource. Let me turn to my oven here. I've got a stainless steel heavy bottom pan, really nice and flat. So I know that I'm going to get a really solid sear once I put the fish in the pan. And what I'm going to do is heat this up to medium high. And we're going to get the pan really nice and hot. It's going to be scary hot. If you're not used to searing fish, you're going to be probably nervous about putting fish in a pan that is this hot because you're probably going to worry about the fish being overcooked. But what we're going to do is hot and fast. And that way we're going to help preserve the juices in the fish, but give it a really nice crisp texture. So 
So this is medium high-ish now. I can really feel the heat emanating off the pan. I'm going to add just enough oil to coat the bottom of it. That's probably maybe a teaspoon or two of oil. And now we're going to let this heat up until it's shimmering, sizzling hot. We definitely do not want to rush putting fish in the pan. I have a filet that I had the frosting in the fridge, had the fish dry. That way it's got a nice tacky surface, nothing that's moist or slippery. So this is going to go into the pan only when the pan is actually hot. And I can see now that the oil is starting to shimmer. Should be about time. So to the fish, I'm gonna just add a little bit of salt. Because I'm gonna add a miso compound butter later, I'm not gonna go too crazy on the salt here. And honestly, I tend not to salt the fish too much when it's plain like this because when it's just a simple sear, because there's a lot of flavor in it already. But to start for pan searing, we're gonna do skin side down. I'm not sure you can hear the sizzle, but it sizzled as soon as the fish hit the fat. And that is a sound you really want to listen for. If you don't hear a sizzle, do not proceed. Take the fish away from the pan and just either let the oil heat up a little more or raise the temperature of your, of your burner. Now that the fish is in the pan, I just turned it down to medium heat because what was really important was that initial contact of the salmon skin to the fat. I made really sure to push down on the filet with the spatula so that it got a really nice solid contact with the fat and that flat surface of the pan. When you don't push down on the fish with the spatula, what happens to the filet is it sort of becomes concave and then you're not going to get a really nice crisp sear on the fish. You're only going to get crispy on the edges. It's still going to be delicious, but that middle part of the filet will have kind of pulled away from the pan and it's not going to be golden and, and lovely. So push down on it, you know, every now and then. I like to do a solid 15 seconds or so as soon as the fish is into the oil. Now, I don't usually use a timer for this, but this total is going to probably be three minutes per side, maybe two to three minutes per side, depending on how thick the filet is. And what I'm looking for now is sort of on the edges of the fish. Let's see if you can see it here. You see that lighter line there? That is the fish starting to change colors as it cooks through. So I'm starting to look for some of that along the edges. But more importantly, what I need is for the fish to release itself from the pan. We're not going to force the filet with the spatula. I know that's really tempting to do. What we're actually doing is forming a really nice bond with the pan so the fish can sear. Once that sear forms, it pulls away from the fat and the metal. So when it's easy to flip, just like this, I barely, barely nudged that, then it's ready to flip. It tells you when it's ready. So for a filet of this thickness, I'm actually going to go ahead and turn off the heat now and let this cook sort of passively in the pan. I'm really happy with how that looks. So we're just going to let the fish basically cook through while it's sitting in the hot pan. There'll be plenty of residual heat in there to get the internal temperature to that really nice flaky medium there that I personally prefer. If you want fish that's a little more medium, if you need it to be medium well to well, I would leave the heat on the oven for maybe a minute or two and let it finish cooking through, but this should be pretty good. Even when I move this to the plate, it'll sort of finish cooking um, through to the center. So we're going to end up with a really nice flaky piece of fish here very shortly. Let me transfer this to out of the pan onto the plate. Pretty golden all around, especially on the corners there. And this is going to be so crispy and delicious that I, I am loath to flip it because if you leave, if you flip it, then the fish will sort of seem that crispiness on the bottom. But here we go. So for the compound butter... Honestly, I would eat this without compound butter on it, but since we're all here, I would just put a nice dollop of that on top. I think I started with about a tablespoon of butter, which may or may not be too much for a single person, but we're just going to go for it. So this will sort of melt over the course of the fish as we're sitting here. And let me show you how flaky this fish is. If you don't check the temperature with an instant read thermometer for any cooking method, what you can do is use your fork. If it flakes really easily, just like that, just pop right off the edge of the filet, then you know the fish is done. I can barely get it onto my fork because it's just flaking apart so perfectly. So 
There we've got a little bite of sockeye salmon was what I used today. A little bit of compound butter. Absolutely delicious and so easy. The skin is still probably a little crispy here. Like I said, you could probably serve it skin side up to help preserve more of that crisp, but really nice, delicious filet of salmon, easily flaked with a fork and just a perfect simple meal. To this, you would want maybe to add something like a side of vegetables or a salad, rice, like a carb to make it feel more filling. That would be wonderful too. But just as a star of the meal, this is absolutely perfect. Well, next week, we're actually making a wonderful dish for leftover salmon. It's kind of almost like a meal prep salmon rice bowl. I'm not a meal pepper, but this is a really fresh, colorful, easy thing that you can have half made already in the fridge. So it's a salmon, kimchi, avocado, cucumber, rice bowl. And um, until then, I hope you get to try this out at home. And uh, thanks for spending some time with us today. Live wild, everyone.